Welcome everybody. This is International Master John Paul Wallace for ChessLecture.com. We've had quite a few re requests recently for end games, and um, I'm up to the task here, and we're going to start with Pawn End Games 101, the very basics. Now, even though we're going to start with the basic ones, we're going to find after a few examples, not likely in today's lecture, but eventually that pawn end games are actually actually horrendously difficult. I was looking at rook end games today with a student and and what I realized not for the first time is that they are just so difficult and uh, even even for masters and grandmasters the amount of mistakes that happen in both complex pawn end games and complex rook end games in particular is uh, is really quite remarkable especially because there's, there's, all, there's sometimes not much to rely on in an endgame. What have you got to sort of go off if um, you can't just read that in an opening book or you, you know that you have to put your, you know, the knight comes out to f3 and the bishop comes out to b5 and we have the Royal Lopez. Endgames are often much trickier than that. On the one hand, they require understanding in a more real, real way than just rattling off openings. But in another sense, they also um, require very concrete calculation. And sometimes it feels impossible to calculate an end game right until the very end. Whereas in a middle game, you might have a situation where, with a bit of hard work, you can calculate the force win right to the end, or you, you realize that you just get a massive attack in one particular variation. In an end game, it's not that simple. And sometimes the fewer pieces on the board, the more difficult it is. Now, if we take a look at the position on the board, we have basically the most simple pawn end game that exists. White's a pawn up, his pawn's going up the board, and he wants to promote on e8. Now, as a coach, I'm no longer surprised when I give this position to a quite a strong player. We're talking about 1500 ELO rating, FIDE rating. It's probably even higher in American rating. That might equate to, say, 1600, 1650, and they don't even know this position. And not only have they not studied it before, but when I play it against them and they have to defend as black, they just lose constantly. They don't even know. They're not even sure whether it's a win or a draw. And if you've never seen it before, that's definitely not immediately obvious. So uh, even strong players struggle with this, but this is really, this is really pawn end game 101. So let's take a look. Now, oh, there's one more feature I'd like to point out in this position that we're going to see by the end of the of the lesson. This is very important. Is the placement of the king, the white king, is what matters. Black obviously has to blockade with his king, so that's sort of less relevant. But the white king is side by side the pawn. Or another way of looking at it is it's not in front of the pawn. Now if we have a situation where the white king was in front of the pawn, blacks uh, sometimes drawing but very often losing. And we'll have a look at when it's a loss and when it's a win later on in the lecture. But if, but if we have a situation where the white king is not further up the board than the white pawn, in this case, it's both on the third rank. If we went up, if, they were, if, if the king was here and the pawn was here, in other words, both on the fourth rank, it would be the same thing. We have a situation where the king is on the same line as the pawn and not further up. It's always a draw. Now, let's take a look why. White to move pushes the pawn. Black is forced backwards. Now, black's task is to stop the pawn reaching e8. So he's got three possible moves to choose from. At the moment, it's not going to make any difference, except king f4, which is quite a ridiculous move anyway. Don't, it's counterintuitive as it is, and not surprisingly, after king d4, black's going to lose. Basically, now, the king is allowed to, going to get in front of the pawn, or more or another way of looking at it is black is not the blocking the pawn and the king and pawn will be able to help each other up the board step by step. 
but black simply takes one step backwards the king comes up and now king d6 this is known as the opposition write down that word opposition the kings are opposing each other you have to understand the opposition if you're going to understand pawn end games now king d6 to give you the terminology that move places white in the opposition or black has the opposition now black having the opposition means white has to the kings are opposing each other and white has to move so white would either have to back off with his king or push his pawn up check now the opposition will make more sense with the more complicated examples first with this example we're just seeing how the king blocks the pawn steady as she goes king here you don't want to allow the king in front of the pawn so to that to that end this would be a terrible mistake it allows the king in front and you'll lose for example king 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 d7 e6 check and you can see the pawn queens now in this position it's fairly obvious that king d6 wins when you know about the opposition because now black is in the white has the opposition this is a case of the opposition where white has it black has to back off and it's to his loss because either way the king breaks through if you go the other way the king breaks through however with a king on the third rank it actually doesn't matter who has the opposition sorry with the king on the sixth rank if the if we shifted this position down and I'll do that for you now if we shift this position down even just one row it's the same position now it does matter whose turn it is black black to move loses white to move draws we're going to come back to that but that wasn't the position we had we had a situation where the king had reached the sixth rank it's a win no matter whose turn it is so etch that into your brain doesn't matter if the king's on the sixth rank for example even if it was white's turn e6 king e8 e7 you have to go to f7 king d7 and, and wins so what went wrong for black there well basically what went wrong was he let the white king in front i said right at the start that's a no-no so when you get this position king d7 i'm laughing on the inside at myself saying a no-no but anyway you get this position king d7 don't let the white king in front e6 check king e7 king e5 okay this is the second position you have to etch in your head second position today but actually out of all the positions I'm going to show you today this is the most important one this is something you can put on your dresser next to your bed basically you've got bad odds here and this is where this is where most students like I said 1600 players lose you've got bad odds if you don't know what you're doing you're just gonna lose uh, basically because you got a 66 percent chance of going to the wrong square you got three options that loses that loses but straight back draws now all you have to do to remember that the easy way you want to go straight back behind the white pawn that's all you have to remember for those of you out there that want to reason I can do that you're gonna gain the opposition by going straight back by king e8 if I go king d6 you go king d8 you have the opposition if I go king f6 you go king f8 again you have the opposition 
if you had gone king d8, I would win by going king d6, and I have the opposition. Uh, to king e8, e7, king f7, king d7, you lose. So the opposition coming into it. So anyway, the simple rule though, just straight back one step behind the pawn. King d6, king d8, you have the opposition. e7 check, king e8. Now you might have noticed we've had this position a few times earlier and black already always lost. We've got a different case now because it's white's turn. It's white to, white to move, only one move, king e6 and a stalemate. Now, unbelievable, but in the end game, more than anything else, is where it matters whose move it is. There are countless positions where if it's your move, you might win, or if it's your move, you might lose, or if it's my move, your move, you might draw. And this sort of all basically depends often on whose turn it is. But, and it's it's in pawn end games this is, and that's because of the opposition. It can change everything around. Okay, so as we just see in that example, the value of whose turn it is to move is extremely important in an end game, particularly a pawn end game. It's almost irrelevant in the middle game. The only situation it could be relevant is um, some freakish cases of of somebody being zugzwanged in the middle game with a lot of pieces on, but that, that's uh, very very rare. But as you'll see with end games, it happens all the time that whose move it is decides the game, whether it's going to be a win or a draw, or sometimes even a loss for that person who would otherwise be winning, all depending on whose turn it is to move. It's a, cri it's a very critical factor. So let's go over that another time. And, I'll, and with black perhaps playing slightly differently to make sure we understand this. Okay. We can make it a deep one this time. Okay, so if we have this position on the board, the most sensible move for black would be king to e4. The reason for this is, again, you don't want to allow the white king in front of its own pawn. Now, it's just a draw because it's the same as the position we looked at before. White has one extra pawn. However, his king's not in front of that pawn. So let's have a look check, king d4, king d2. Now, if you're a perfectionist, you, sh you should go to d5 here, because then after king c3, king c5 is the opposition, or king e3, king e5 is the opposition. But this is not going to matter until you hit the back rank where you have to go to d8. So at this stage, you can just as well go to c5, king c3, king d5, there's no difference. d4, you could go to d6 or c6, king c4, king d6, d5, king d7, king c5, king c7, don't let his king in front, d6 check, king d7, king d5, and now we're, again we've reached the position where you have to choose the right square, the odds are against you, but if you remember to go behind the pawn, then I think your odds are actually pretty good. King d8, only move. King c6, king c8, d7, king d8, king d6, and again we have a stalemate. Now, let's take a look at a more complicated example now. Let's say we have a position like this. Now this is a nightmare to calculate if you had to calculate this to the end. But if you use the principles of the opposition, things get a lot easier. Basically, black's task, if it's black to move, is to rush your king forward as quickly as possible to blockade the pawn and stop white getting his king in front of the pawn. White's task is the opposite. He wants to get his king in front of the pawn and gain the opposition, hopefully, in the process. So let's have a look and see what happens if it's black's turn. King e7. King d2. King d6. 
Now we have a case here of the long distance or the long range opposition because there's three squares in the middle. You could either look at it like that or you could look at it like the d4 square is sort of in the middle of both kings. So you have a situation where king up, king up, opposition to black. King up, king up. Again, black has the opposition. So it's the long range opposition because you're going to get the opposition. But in a sense, you've already got it. So for example, what uh, remembering that what has to get his king in front of his pawn if he's going to have any chance whatsoever. But the problem for him, if king e3, as I just said, king e5 gains the opposition. King d3, king d5. This is the problem. King c3 is useless. You could either play... You could still play king c5, and you still draw. However, king e5 is probably more principal because it's both in front of the pawn and it gains the diagonal opposition. If king d3, king d5 were back to the frontal opposition. So as you're seeing, the, the opposition is the critical factor in understanding how to win and how to draw, both. So let's prove why this is a draw, because it, it might not be immediately obvious why this position is a draw. Basically, sooner or later, despite white's king being in front of the pawn, because black has the opposition, eventually he has to give ground and either go back, in which case we have our classic draw, with black in front of the pawn, or move his pawn up one or two squares, in which case again we have our classic draw, because once again the white king is not in front of the pawn. And you just draw this quite easily with the technique I showed the in the very first two examples. Okay, let's take it back to this position with white to move. We'll see that things are very different then. White to play wins after king d2, king d7, king d3, and black has a problem. If king e6, king e4, white has the opposition. If king d6, king d4, white has the opposition. And just to prove how it's a win, let's play through it. King d6, and now you have a choice. Do you play e3, or do you play king f5? Well, the answer is that e3 would be a terrible mistake, because after king e6, it's a draw. It's exactly the same position we looked at in, in the previous example, in the third example, except one row up before the pawn was on e2, the king was in e3, and black's king was in e5. Now we're one row up, but the position's the same. Black has gained the opposition, and it's a draw. However, this position is winning, and after king d6, you just go king f5. Note, if it was this position with white to move, he wins, because he can just play e3. If white had... If white had the move here, he would win with e3, gaining the opposition, because then it would be black's turn to move. So, just to prove why this position's a win after king f5, let's play it out. King d5, you could try that. Um, well, there's more than one way to skin a cat here. e4, check. King d6. King f6, very important move. e5 would be a terrible blunder, because king e7... We're back into pawn endgame 101, our very first example. But we've moved on from there. We're big guys now. Pawn endgame 104, king f6, winning. You march the pawn up using the king on the side. King d7, e5. And now e5 is the correct move. King f7 wouldn't really achieve anything because just king d6. You have to go back and he goes back doesn't hurt anything, but you just repeat moves. But after e5, white, black has a terrible problem because king d8, king f7, and you just march on. Or king e8, and now not e6, triple question mark, king f8, draw. Pawn end game 101. But king, but king e6, gaining the opposition, and if king d8, king f7, with a win again. Alternatively, king f8, king d7, again with a win.
Okay. Now, as you saw from that example, White had about at least three opportunities to muck it up once he had a winning position. So he had to constantly make sure he keeps the opposition. He has to also constantly make sure he does not let the Black King in front. But with but if you play through that a few times with yourself, with a partner, whatever, you'll get the hang of it. And after a while, it's pretty much second nature. But I do recommend you, you play through it. Even just playing both white and black by yourself, it's a very, very good way to master these type of pawn end games. You don't have to tell your mates at the pub that that's how you spend your evenings. Alrighty. Now... We're up to pawn in game 105, the past pawn. Now, let's try and understand what is a past pawn. If we have, let's make it a pawn on c4. And black has a pawn on c7, or anywhere, c7, c6, or c5. This white pawn is not passed because it cannot reach the other end. On the other hand, if we had a pawn on e7, both pawns are passed. It's a passed pawn because nothing can prevent that pawn, no other pawns can prevent that pawn from reaching the other side. It's irrelevant if there's a piece. Bishop on c7 still makes this a passed pawn. It's only in relation to other pawns. On the other hand, if the pawn was on b7 or alternatively on d7, b7 or d7, the pawn is still not passed because it can it can be captured. Okay, now passed pawns, as you can imagine, are critical for the end game. Because if you've got a passed pawn, you're basically just going to mop up. Now, particularly if what you have is called an outside passed pawn. For example. If we have a position like this, white would have an outside pass pawn. Now, normally an outside pass pawn is an absolute killer because he outside pass pawn means further on the outside. It doesn't have to be the A file. It could also be on the H file. By the time black goes and grabs that pawn, then white's going to mop up the other two pawns. Now, this is normally enough to win an outside pass pawn. There's something even more deadly than the outside pass pawn, which is a protected pass pawn, but we'll come to that in our next lecture on pawn end games. However, let's take a look at an example of an outside pass pawn from a practical game between Barsov and Brunner, both players grandmasters, and interestingly they did not play it perfectly. They both... Well, actually, white played pretty darn well, but black made a mistake and threw away a win. Easy to do in point end games. We'll flip the board, so we'll look at it from black's point of view. King on c6 there, pawn on b5. Pawns on f5, g6, and h7. White has a king on b4, pawns on e3, f2, g2, and h3. Okay, now this position is good for black because he has the outside passed pawn. The pawns are equal, but this pawn is, the, is a very advantageous for black because White's king is offside. It has to go out midfield, no, sorry, left of field to cover that pawn. Meanwhile, at the right moment, Black is going to jettison his pawn and clean up White's pawns. For example, he could have won here with king b6. He didn't play that, by the way. So even grandmasters are marking these end games up. They're not easy. F3. King c6, 
there was some comments, uh, feedback, that there's too much openings. And, um, well, openings are important. As you can see, sooner or later, you're just going to get a position. You might even get an end. You will get an end game. And it's the ability to play the end games. What's the point of having a winning end game if you don't know how to win? King d6, jettisoning that pawn. King takes b5, king e5. Now, as you can see, material is going to be equal. I'm going to get that pawn back, but look at the advantage of my king position over yours. That is the key advantage in understanding the outside pass pawn. Now, king c5, king takes e4. Black, white has to run like mad to try and catch up, but basically he's not going to make it. King f6, king takes g2. King g7. King g7 is hopeless. You could try h4. King g3. King g5 is a very clever try. Because if it's your turn, you'll play h5 with a draw. But it's my turn. I said, so, I said that it's so important whose turn it is in pawn end games. h5 and forget about it. You're lost. Your king. This position would be a draw. If your king was an h2 or g2, but you're totally on the wrong side, this is an easy win now for me to get my pawn down to h1. Now, if we go back to the start, black played a natural-looking move, h5. This was a critical blunder. To understand why, it's going to be because that king is eventually going to run over to f7. Okay. Now, in our last example, we noticed that it got... The pawn, it had to go further, one step fo closer, it had to go to g7, and then gobble the pawn on h7. Now you're actually closer, so why did black actually gave himself a weakness on g6. This is a grandmaster mucking up a pawn end game. Believe me, it happens all the time. Pawn end games are very complicated. h4, king b6, f3, king c6, this is the game, e4, F takes e4, F takes e4, king b6, e5, king c6, e6, king d6, king takes b5, king takes e6. Now, very nice move, king c6. This is much better than king c5. That would be a blunder, because of king e5, it's known as shouldering off the black the white king. You go to e5 rather than f5 straight away to shoulder off and push away the white king. But by going to c6, king e5 is useless because you just come around the back. So in that case, after king c6, black played king f5, but now it's a draw. King d6, king g4, king e6, king h4, king f6, g5, king f5, and despite the extra pawn, it's a draw, because after g4, king f4, g3, king f5, we finish this with a beautiful stalemate. They should have played the last moves out, it would have been very nice, but both grandmasters saw what was going to happen and agreed to a draw. So that wraps up pawn endgame 101. We're going to be continuing with pawn endgame 102, where we're going to be taking a look at the past, sorry, the uh, protected past pawn, which is, uh, you can probably work out what that is actually, and um, then look at some more complicated positions with pawn endgames. I hope that that's fulfilled something of what um, the members have been looking for with the endgames, and uh, feel free to send back feedback on uh, what you thought of this lecture, but also what you'd like to see and particularly in the end game, if, if that's what you're looking for, then let us know. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to presenting the next lecture.